The war on drugs has lost one of its lieutenants tonight. The high-profile DEA agent who spent much of his career working dangerous undercover assignments has left the agency. Steve Walker sat down with this maverick agent and has his story. He helped bring down some of the biggest drug kingpins in Mexico and South America by pretending to be one of them. Tonight, this San Diego man talks candidly about what it's like to be deep undercover. In the war on drugs, some soldiers fight from the inside. For years, Michael Vahil infiltrated the cartels without a gun, without anyone to watch his back. But it's nothing more than, you know, gut instinct and your intellect and your gift of gab and those are your primary weapons when you're working undercover. The heel began his undercover career buying heroin and busting little guys. He was good at it, really good at it, and he quickly graduated to a much higher and more dangerous level. The heel was sent alone into the mountains of Mexico. At one point asked by traffickers to prove himself by doing drugs. Even asked if he was willing to kill. You had to know the jargon you had to know how to respond to the questions being posed to you by these drug traffickers. So it was a chess of life and death where if you made a mistake, you could actually end up by paying with your life. Vahil was able to avoid doing drugs and committing violent acts by claiming to be more interested in profit. But he did come close to being killed numerous times. Once after another federal agent lost his gun to a drug trafficker and Vahil's cover was blown shot him in the head and then fired two rounds at me probably from a distance of three feet and I could feel the bullets uh, whiz by my head. Did you think you were going to die? There were many times when I thought that, uh, you know, during the shootouts. Shootouts like this one last year, caught on tape by a Mexican television news crew. A lot of times I'd be working undercover and uh, get uh, involved in a crossfire between the federal police, let's say in Mexico, and the traffickers with bullets bouncing uh, you know, in front of me and in, uh, behind me. But perhaps Vahil's most treacherous assignment took him to Colombia and very close to one of the most dangerous men in the world, infamous drug lord Pablo Escobar. Vahil worked his way so far into Escobar's violent organization that he sat just feet away from the feared kingpin at soccer games. He was it, the boss of it all, El Magico. Hollywood's version of Escobar in the film Blow only scratches the surface, says Vahil, who knew firsthand of Escobar's enormous wealth and reputation for killing anyone who got in his way. How dangerous was it? At that time, I would leave my house in the morning going to work and I would see bodies strewn on the roads in Medellin. Many of those were killed by the drug traffickers. Including one day, a DEA informant. He was tortured and then eventually shot uh, several times in the head. Very, very violent organization. Later in his career, Vahil's undercover work took him to Brazil, where he made what was the largest seizure of cocaine at the time. But eventually, this Nerves of Steel agent came out from the shadows and took a much more public role. This was an international uh, consortium. Vigil went on to become the DEA's chief of international operations. Most recently, he was in charge of the DEA's San Diego office. It's a far cry from chasing drug lords in the jungles of Colombia, but Vigil says those years of deep undercover work made him the leader he is today. If you ask me, would I change anything? Absolutely not. Because as they say in that old Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. Last month, Vahil left the DEA after a 30-year career. He now works in the private sector. Marty, Susan. Thank you, Steve. Dramatizations on America's Most Wanted. The man you're about to meet has been in real-life shootouts and on major drug busts. Pete Fuentes profiles the special agent in charge of the DEA here in San Diego. almost got killed several times, uh, was involved in several shootouts. In fact, uh, in one shootout, the uh, violator uh, fired two rounds, probably no more than three feet away, and I could hear 
the bullets as they whiz by my head. Welcome to the life of a career DEA agent. Michael Vigil is special agent in charge of the local Drug Enforcement Administration. They were distributing kilogram quantities of cocaine. You've seen him in the news detailing the activities of Mexican drug cartels. During his tenure, local authorities have stepped up their arrests and convictions of drug lords and their cronies. Vigil traveled the world for the agency and quickly earned a reputation for undercover work. He was assigned on missions with a late Kiki Camarena, the fabled DEA agent who was brutally tortured and killed in Mexico almost 20 years ago. And when John Walsh of America's Most Wanted profiled the notorious Smile Zambada drug organization, they called on Vigil for inside information. I consider you and all these guys and women here that work so hard our partners. What you do is you match your intellect with the intellect of the drug traffickers. You have to know how to respond, you have to know how to act, you have to know the jargon, you have to know the prices of these drugs, and you quickly have to size up these violators and you have to be a master psychologist. Oh, after two short years as local DEA director and 30 in the department, the Hill is retiring. Between both of us, you know, we have 200 years of service to, uh, the, to the uh, country. Many agree San Diego has been safer during his watch. I'm going to miss San Diego. I, I think that it's a great city, great people. I thank everybody for, you know, all their support. Quite frankly, uh, you know, it's been uh, an adventure rather than a job, truly. Pete Fuentes, Fox 6 News. Michael Vigil will start work on Monday for a private consulting firm working with the military and law enforcement. He'll be based out of Washington, D.C. Oh, good luck to him. Yeah. America's most wanted tonight. First, we got to find the bank robber who took on a cop in a close range shootout. Then we're on the hunt for a drug kingpin who uses machine guns like he's Al Capone. And we'll tell you about what happened thanks to your great tips from last week. We're not looking for trouble, we're looking for justice. And the manhunt starts right now. agents are acting out a drug raid on a crystal meth lab. And as you can see, they don't mess around. They bring the manpower and the firepower to finish the job. A lot of these same agents may be doing this for real to grab our next fugitive, and he's a big one. Mexico's new drug lord, a violent, violent thug who makes his way up here to Southern California all the time. And as our Ed Miller reports, he's not going to give up his vast drug empire without a hell of a fight. For more than a decade, Mexico's Ariano Felix family controlled most of the cocaine coming into this country. And they did it with an iron fist. Even killing innocent women and children in their quest to stay on top. But in February 2002, the gang's ruthless leader, Ramon Ariano Felix, found himself on the other end of a gun. A Mexican policeman shot him dead in the town of Mazatlan. But Mexican authorities now believe Ramon's fate was not the result of good police work or even good luck. They say the cop who shot the drug lord down was working for a rival kingpin, a man named Ismael Zambada Garcia. By knocking off Ariano Felix, either directly or indirectly, he became the number one kingpin in Mexico. 
This kingpin began as a low-level drug runner and built a long and sordid track record of violence. He's even linked to one of the most notorious attacks against an American law enforcement agent, the 1985 kidnapping of DEA agent Kiki Camarena. The kidnappers tortured Agent Camarena with electricity for days, trying to get him to give up the names of who the DEA was investigating and who was squealing. The torture finally killed him. Zimbabwe has a special place in addition to being a major trafficker in that he participated in the torture murder of Agent Kiki Camarena. From there, agents say, Zambada Garcia steadily climbed to the top, leaving behind a trail of bodies. Lisa! Just this month, Mexican police say his henchman assassinated a former Mexican deputy attorney general in an open-air restaurant in Tijuana. They left a handful of bullets on the floor as a message. There are plenty more bullets, and they're not afraid to use them. It says that he's a stone killer. It says that he's a ruthless individual and that he is willing to execute even members of his own family in order to climb that, the ladder of power. The Mexican Justice Department says this is what Zimbabwe's henchmen used to keep people in line, this black market submachine gun. In two seconds, it can empty a 30-round clip. He uses machine guns very much like Al Capone did during the Roaring Twenties in Chicago. I would describe Mr. Sambada as a human weapon of mass destruction. Recently, Mexican police stopped a suspicious motorcade and found themselves in the middle of a shootout with Zambada's top lieutenant, Javier Torres Felix. The gun battle left a Mexican policeman and a civilian bystander dead. In the end, Torres was taken into custody. But even with his top lieutenant captured, the Zimbabwe drug factory keeps on churning. He'll do whatever it takes to get the product onto the other side of the border for distribution, because it's all about money. This will give you some idea of how far Zambada's people will go to get their drugs into the United States. Right behind that fence is Mexico, this side a parking lot in California. Cops say Zambada has used lots of tunnels, but this one has a rather ingenious exit here on the American side of the border. They connected the drug tunnel to an American storm drain. The idea was to create an exit door that would not look suspicious. The smugglers would then park a truck with a hole in the bottom right over the manhole and then load huge amounts of drugs up into the truck. It costs between $800,000 and a million dollars to construct one of these tunnels, but once you move a drug load into the United States, that tunnel is paid for. In the past two years, agents have found more than 10 drug tunnels along the U.S.-Mexican border. This is the beginning of the wood area. Most believed to be used by Zimbada. But Zimbada himself has proven hard to find. One reason is the hush money he pays to so many people. Because of his wealth, he has been able to influence the peasants in the countryside, sort of like a Robin Hood. Zimbada has become a multi-millionaire and lives in several lavish homes. He even owns a dairy and a huge ranch called the Grand Scorpion. But Mexican authorities and the DEA have not been able to catch him in any of them. And worse, this violent drug lord could be hiding out in the United States. Cops say he uses phony driver's licenses with fake names like this one to cross the border. It's not just to check up on his drug business, he also visits several different girlfriends. Mexican police say he recently underwent plastic surgery and they believe he now looks like this computer-enhanced photo. The DEA has plastered it on huge billboards along highways between Tucson and Phoenix, Arizona. It's an area where he's likely to surface. The State Department is offering up to a $5 million reward for the capture of Ismael Zambada Garcia. If you have information that can take him down, call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV.
Now, whether it's a small meth lab like this or a big-time cartel like Zambadas, it's great to have these guys on our team out there fighting to take them down. And tonight, they need your help. And I want you to remember two things. You can call and remain anonymous, and our operators will take your call in Spanish. Zambadas.